Good morning. Welcome to the worship and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been a rough week. We have a divided nation, but whether you voted for Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump, you are welcome here, and Jesus Christ is still king. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to welcome all who are here in the sanctuary this morning in beautiful downtown Clarksburg, West Virginia, at the corner of 2nd and Main Street. I'd also like to welcome those who are listening in on the radio or joining us through Facebook or Zoom. We are delighted to have you with us. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Call your attention to the announcements that are printed in your bulletin. Flowers and earth dust this morning are given to the glory of God and love and memory of Trey Tyson. We love you given by Karen and Adam Tyson. Congratulations to the Liberty High School cheerleaders. They're winning of the regional championship. We want to remember our veterans today. Veterans Day is coming up this week. And we want to remember and thank all of those for their service in the United States military, and especially those who gave their life for the freedom that we enjoy. I want to thank Amy Strange and her crew for the yard sale and all the work that went into it. I think we, we made about $160 Friday more on top of everything else, so it wasn't a big thing, but it was a, a real service to the community and people were able to come in and get some clothing and things that they needed. So again, thanks very much to them. There is a thing in your bulletin about the hygiene kits. We'll be putting those together uh, next Sunday, right? Next Sunday before church during Sunday school. So if you want to help with that, and if you want to donate to that, there's a table out in Westminster Hall where you can put your stuff on. So uh, this morning is Stewardship Sunday, and we can talk more about that later, but you will have in your bulletin both uh, your estimate of giving and your pledge for giving. Uh, financially as well as your time and talent sheets and we encourage you to fill those out place them in the offering plates by the door or mail them in tomorrow a prayer group at 10 o'clock and in the afternoon the personnel committee will be meeting with the staff of the church for their annual reviews and i just i want to say about our staff that we are so very blessed with the staff of this church we have an excellent staff, and they do such outstanding work, and I thank God for each and every one of them. Deacon meeting will be uh, Tuesday. Not sure why it says 440. It should say 430. Uh, but I guess if anybody's 10 minutes late, they're on time this time. Deacon's meeting Tuesday at 430, and Bible study Wednesday at 330. Are there other announcements this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Just a couple of um, extra things about um, some announcements that Pastor John had. This um, Sunday, today, we are resuming our s'more time with God activity, and that's our family activity that we have. Um, where we do a Bible lesson and a craft. And if you are able to attend that, please let me know so that way I have an accurate head count and make sure we have enough material. So we're excited to um, be bringing that back. It is a family um, style event. So all of your family is welcome to attend with you. And we will, um, it's a beautiful day today. So we will actually be able to be outside hopefully. Um, if not, we, when the weather turns um, not so beautiful, we will be meeting in Westminster Hall in the gym area. So if you are able to attend, please let me know. We will um, begin about 5 o'clock this evening. Pastor John mentioned about the hygiene kits. Our children and our youth um, are going to be helping with a mission project every month. So one Sunday a month during our Sunday school time, we will be using that time together to help with a mission project. So this month, our mission project is the hygiene kits that we'll be packing and distributing to local schools um, for students. So 
all of our children and our youth and their families are invited to come join with us next Sunday about 9.30 and we'll have an assembly line and pack those things together. And then each month we will be doing a different activity, a different mission project um, one Sunday every month. Um, with our children and our youth. So we look forward to that time together and outreaching to our community. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. If you would join me in our call to worship. In life and in death, we belong to God. In life and in death, we belong to God. Body, mind, and spirit. In worship and in work, in sharing and in, a, in service, we belong to the triune God. Hallelujah. O Lord, when we gather in your name, we are a chain of change. There is no way around it. We cannot come together in your presence and not be moved. So today, we surrender to your moving and to the ways you desire to change us. Let this hour together be sacred. And may your name be made great. You are holy, worthy, and full of glory. We are humbled to be in your presence. Receive our worship as an offering of praise. It is all through you. Amen. Please stand if you're able and read the hymn, the, or not read the hymn, sing the hymn, the old rugged cross is printed in the book.
Scripture reminds us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and hope, let us confess our sin to God. If you'll join me in the prayer of confession. We confess one God alone. Call us back, gracious God, when, when we wander from you, tempted by the idols of wealth or privilege. We strive to serve God alone. Forgive us when we do not want to serve you, when the price seems greater than we are willing to pay. We are invited to trust in God alone. Forgive us when our faith wavers, when we demand to be in charge of our own lives. Help us to know the wonder of letting go, of sharing what we have, and of believing in you, O Lord. Provide all we need. The assurance of forgiveness. Friends, hear the good news. We are forgiven and redeemed through the grace of Jesus Christ. And we are renewed by the Holy Spirit so that our whole lives may show gratitude to God for God's incredible goodness. Thanks Thank be to God. God. Amen. Amen. we have several young people who fall into those categories. Here's another one, athletic skills. You're good at playing a sport. We've got intellectual gifts. You do well in school. And artistic talents. You paint, Draw, dance, maybe a little acting. Some of us have been given one of those talents. Some of us have been given multiple talents. But no matter what God, what gifts God gives us, I know that He has given each and every one of us a special gift. When God gives us a gift, he expects us to use it. He doesn't want that gift to go to waste. God wants you to take that gift and use it, show others how great he is. That's what our Bible lesson is about today. 
It's about a parable. Jesus tells us many parables. A parable is a story that teaches us a lesson. Well, this lesson is the story that Jesus is telling us is a man is going on a long trip. And before he left, he called his servants together. One servant, he gave five bags of gold. Second servant, he gave only two bags of gold. And the third servant, he gave one bag. And then he left on his journey. While he was gone, the first servant with his five bags of gold worked really hard. And he doubled his, his money. He had, then had 10 bags of gold. The man with two bags of gold doubled his. Then he had four bags. But the one servant that had only one bag of gold, he went out and dug a hole and buried his boss's money. When the man returned, he asked his servants to share what they did with the gifts that he had given them. And of course, the first one said, well, I worked and, and I doubled mine. I now have 10 bags of gold. And the second, I doubled mine. I now have four bags. And he was very, very pleased. He said, well done, because you have used what I gave you well. I will give you much more. When the third servant went to tell him, he said, I, well, he said, I was afraid. So I took what you gave me, and I dug a hole in the ground, and I buried it. He said, what? You mean you didn't even take it to the bank and get a little bit of interest on it? Well, I took the gold from him and gave it to the servant who had doubled his, who now had 10 bags of gold. And he said, to those who make what they have been given better, we'll give them more. But those who do nothing, theirs will be taken away. Sometimes we might think God hasn't given us very much talent. We might even be tempted to hide our talent. But when we use our God-given talent to be all that God planned for us to be, he will give us even more. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, we thank you for the gifts you've given us. We pray that we will be faithful in using these gifts to show others how wonderful you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me in our prayer for illumination. God of all truth, let your word fall upon us like a rough and cleansing wind, dispersing our sins, scattering our vanities, uprooting our indifference, so that shaken loose from our illusions, we shall be open to your love and ever taken by your truth. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our first scripture lesson this morning is taken from Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 3a, and again, 14 through 25. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel, of Israel to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your ancestors, Hira and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him with sincerity and faithfulness. 
Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great things in our sight. He protected us all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And in the Lord, and the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore also we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord for his own. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will consume. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you. And having, done, and having done you no good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Our New Testament lesson for today comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 14. Listen. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves <clears throat> and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, <coughs> excuse me, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made you five more. <coughs> Excuse me. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. For but those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Invite you to join with me in the affirmation from your bulletin. I am a child of God. 
I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that he has the power to change my life and your life. I was intrigued by a short story I read a while back in a book written by James W. Moore about a story about a young woman who felt like she was demon-possessed. She was sure she had seven demons in her. And so she went to Jesus for help. And Jesus assured her that he could help. And he said to her, I can cast out those seven demons and heal you. Would you like that? To which she replied, would you mind casting out just six of them? I was intrigued, wondering about what is it we're trying to hold on to, our favorite idol, our favorite sin. In our Old Testament lesson, Joshua is challenging the Israelites. They have entered the promised land. They've conquered the land. They're settling in. And now he reminds them not to forget the one who has brought them this far. He asks them three times to choose who they will serve. Whether they'll serve the gods of their ancestors, the idols of before, or the idols of the people around them. Will they serve instead the Lord God? And they keep saying yes, but you get the feeling that Joshua has his doubts because he keeps asking. And indeed, there seems reason for that. Because time and time again, the Israelites drift away from God. In spite of their solemn vows, in spite of their good intentions, they follow after other gods. Sometimes the Israelites turned away from God completely. But what they did more often was simply add and were split their worship, added other gods, divided their worship between God and idols. Now I want you to understand that <clears throat> the Israelites were close to the land. There was so much about their lives that they didn't control. They were dependent upon the weather. They were dependent upon so many factors that they didn't control as to whether they had a good harvest or not, whether their animals produced or not, whether there was disease or not. The people of the land that had been there before the Israelites conquered worshipped a variety of fertility gods called the Baals. And so, continually, there were those Israelites who began to doubt the providence of the one true God. They began to doubt that God could actually deliver for them. And so they started hedging their bets by also worshiping these idols, these fertility gods, false gods. Well... Aren't we glad we're beyond that? Aren't we glad we don't worship stone or golden idols anymore? Well, we may have gotten beyond the stone and golden idols, but we're not past the worship of idols themselves. See, idols come in all different styles and types. Even ideas can be idols. Ideas, goals, purposes, even our very selves. I was watching a, a horse show the other day. I like horses. I was watching this rodeo show, and they had this particular uh, event where they were using draft horses, eight horse draft horse teams, and they were driving them around in the arena, turning them in circles and complicated patterns. It's incredible to me. There were all kind of these huge draft horses. There were Clydesdales, there were Belgians, there were Showers, there were Percherons, beautiful horses. Well, one of the 
driver says he entered the, the arena with his team of beautiful, matched, well-trained black percher horses. And the announcer quoted this driver as saying, there's really only two breeds of horses in the world. There are Percherons, and then there's something else, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Uh, partially because my dad had Percheron workhorses when we were growing up. But I also thought about that something else. I thought about that from the perspective, there is the worship of the one true God, and then there is the worship of something else, anything else that becomes an idol for us. Anything that we give ultimate authority to in our lives can become an idol. Common idols that people talk about in our world today, money, power, success, prestige, Will Willimon has suggested that the most popular idol in our culture today is the worship of one's own self. That as a matter of fact, this idea of worshiping money or power or prestige or all those things is really just symptoms of worshiping one's own self. You see, our society has all this emphasis on individuality. Some of that's good. We tell people to maximize your potential, to live the best life you can, and that's good. But when we take that to extremes, when that becomes our purpose in life and our only purpose in life, we're beginning to worship ourselves rather than God. Willimon points out that in many of the traditional Christian hymns, older hymns, the the most popular word in those hymns is God or Lord or Jesus Christ. He also points out that in contemporary music, and I love some of contemporary music, don't get me wrong, but he points out the preponderance of the words I and my and mine and our in these songs. There's a shift away from the worship of God to the worship of self. Our worship is not about us, it's about God. We live in a consumer culture and it's creeping into even our worship. It's creeping into how we live out our faith. Two of the most popular faith books that have come out in recent years, I was thinking about this, one of them is called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Another one is called Your Best Life Now by Joe Olstein. And they're good books. They've helped a lot of people. But there's a danger in them. And I wonder, I mean, even in the titles, would it have sold as well if instead of the purpose-driven life, the title had been the God-driven life? In Joel's book about Your Best Life Now, would it have sold as well if the title had been How God Can Get the Most Out of You? Hmm. See, Warren intends his book for good purpose, to guide people into discovering God's purpose in their life. It's a wonderful thing. But the danger exists for people to hear just the word purpose and to start thinking about what is my purpose in life, and develop our own purpose apart from God. So that instead of worshiping God, we begin to worship purpose itself, which becomes an idol. Joel also has a book that's helped a lot of people. It's intended to help people find and develop a great relationship with God. But again, the danger is that even from the very title, there's this thing about how you can get the most for you. Almost as if the title of the book is how you can get the most out of God. Instead of the other way around, the biblical idea of how we can serve God most fully.
The worship of self is prevalent. It's everywhere. I want you to look now with me at our New Testament lesson. There Jesus tells a parable. One of many parables that Jesus tells. A parable about a master who entrusts three of his servants with his property, with his money, while he goes on vacation to the Caribbean. Well, maybe not the Caribbean, but anyway, he goes away. So the master in the parable is obviously God, and we are the servants. Now, I want to point out two words that are key to understanding this parable, and those words are entrust and afraid. God entrusts us with good gifts and expects us to trust him and his character as we use those good gifts for God's glory. The first servants did just that. They invested the money wisely. When the master returned, they doubled the investment that they gave back. The third servant was afraid. He was afraid of the master. He did not trust the master's character. So instead of risking, he simply held on to it, buried it in the ground, and gave it back the same as he had received it. There's a reason that scripture so often repeats the words, fear not, and be not afraid, because fear leads us into the worship of ourselves. Trust leads us into the worship of God. Listen again to the words of the third servant. And I want you to remember that the master in this story is God. Now, does this sound like God's character being described? The third servant says, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed, and so I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Does that sound like a description of God? Does it sound like the God who was revealed to us in Jesus Christ and his willing death on the cross for our sakes? Of course not. God is not harsh or selfish, unloving. The servant's fear that God might be harsh led him into the worship of himself, led him into disaster. How often do we get caught in that same trap by our fears, our fears for our security, our fears that God somehow will not come through for us? Of all of the demons that God would cast out from us. Is there one that we hang on to? Is there one that's named self we refuse to let go of? You know, I sometimes wish in this parable that there was a fourth servant. I imagine the fourth servant having received his money, his master's money, and going out and unwisely investing it and losing the whole thing. And I imagine that servant coming back to the master with empty hands and say, I invested it, but I lost it. And the master saying, you're forgiven. Because that's God's character. That's who God is. God gives us second chances. The willingness to risk is our trust of God's character, both to provide for us and to forgive our failures. I think possibly there's, a, there's another reason why there's no fourth servant in this parable, and that's because there's a limit to this parable, as to all parables, and we can't push it too far. You see, one of the things is that in the parable, the master goes away. God never goes away. God gives us talents and gifts to use for him, but God is still with us. God is in the very investment itself. I'm not saying that 
we're always going to be successful in an earthly sense of the word when we invest ourselves in the kingdom. But I am saying that God is in that investment and that God is able to bring fruit for the kingdom from that investment when we're willing to trust him. Another thought that's occurred to me, a limitation of this particular parable, is that what is entrusted to us is much more than simply money. It's everything God has given us. All of our gifts, all of our talents, all of our intellect, our energy, our influence, our very selves. We are to invest ourselves into the kingdom work. I want to share a story that I read recently in Dynamic Preaching Magazine. A certain successful businessman from Seattle named Robert Young <clears throat> read in the newspaper about Native American elders freezing to death in South Dakota because they didn't have adequate housing on the reservation. And he couldn't explain why, but for some reason he could not get that story out of his mind. And so he did some re more research and he discovered that there was a foundation where you could adopt a grandparent on one of these reservations. And so he applied, and he was paired with a 78-year-old Native American woman named Catherine Redfeather. And she wrote him letters back in reply to his letters, welcomed him into her family, called him her newest grandson. Well. Young wrote her a letter and said to her, I'd like to do something nice for you. Is there something nice that I could get for you? And Catherine Redfeather wrote back and she said, well, some shampoo and a bottle of aspirin would be nice. Robert Young could not imagine living in such poverty that shampoo and aspirin are luxury items something nice. And so he and his wife decided to go visit the reservation to see for themselves. And they were shocked at the poverty there. They were also taken aback by the welcome that they got, that they were received with such love and such joy. Well, later they came back that summer and with the help of some volunteers, they built a warm, secure house for Catherine. And the whole community showed out up when the house was finished in a joyous celebration. And when that was done, Robert and Anita traveled back to Seattle. And they thought then they would simply resume their old life. But God was still working on them. And they couldn't let go of this. And so after much prayer and research, they sold Robert's half of the business, moved to Montana, and established a foundation there called the Catherine Redfeath Development Group. Its purpose is to provide safe, secure, affordable housing for Native Americans. That's trust. That's stepping out in faith. That's investing oneself in the kingdom of God. Remember that I said the key to this parable is in those two words, in trust and afraid. God has entrusted us with great gifts, time and energy and talents and intelligence and money. But God can't use you for his glory if you are afraid to invest in his kingdom. The Christian life is not for the fearful. It's for those who will not settle for anything less than to live in holy boldness with God's guidance. The Christian life is not for the fearful. It is for those who will not settle for anything else than living the way God wants them to live. May God move us on to his will this day, and may his name be ever praised. Let us go to God in silent prayer.
Amen. I did want to just say something about silence. Every once in a while, somebody says to me, reminds me that it's awkward when we're broadcasting on the radio to have these moments of silence. And I know that that's true. But I also know and am convinced that silence is an important part of the worship of God. And that God often speaks to us in the silence. So I don't want to give that up. I invite you to stand at this time if you're able. We say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, or not the Apostles' Creed, the creed that's printed in your bulletin, which is part of a brief statement of faith. Christians, let us say what we believe. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks, to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is, Lord, I want to be a Christian.
may be seated. As we come this morning, we come knowing that God is in control. I'm glad he's in control. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning. We've had some ups and downs. We've had some good things and some bad things. We've had some things that went our way and things that just didn't go our way. But through it all, we were able to witness the fact that you are still in control of everything. And for that, we thank you. We thank you because you've kept us another day. We thank you for another opportunity to be able to tell the world that you live and you live within us. The song says, I want to be more like Jesus in my heart. So we just ask you, Lord, open up our hearts and minds that we may understand one another. Open up our hearts and minds that we may be able to not only talk with one another, but to live in peace and harmony with one another. We thank you, Lord, because You've given us peace within ourselves. There are families who are split today. But we ask you to just to give them the knowledge and the understanding to be able to be a family once again. And Father, as we come this morning, we come knowing that there is no one above you. Words in the scripture says, I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made the heavens and the earth. As we look to you today, we look to you for the guidance, for, the, for all the knowledge and for the understanding of how we may see tomorrow and face tomorrow. And we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for giving your son that we might have a right to the tree of life. We thank you because you kept us through all the ups and downs and through the toils. We thank you for never leaving us, always being beside us and going with us wherever we go. And for this, we just say thank you. There's not enough tongues that we can thank you enough for all that you have done. Now, Father, as we close out this prayer, we just ask you to go with us and guide us and keep us in all that we do. Be with us. Give us strength. Give us courage. And give us understanding. In thy name we pray. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our service with the presentation of our offerings and also a reminder for you to fill out the uh, pledge cards and time and talent sheets. Uh, sometimes people say to me, well, why do we need to do that year after year? Well, a couple of reasons. First, the 
ministry of the church depends upon the support of the congregation. And secondly, because there is no growth, there is no change without setting some goals, without having something that we're shooting towards. And so we encourage you to do this and just either mail them into the church office or uh, put them in the offering plates by the doors. With gladness, with joy, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord.
song. I want to thank Don and Jeff for sharing their talents with us this morning and for lifting our hearts to God. ourselves into your kingdom, that your name may be great in all the earth. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Our last hymn is, O oh, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. church of Jesus Christ wherever you may be. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon us now and always. 